All right, so good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Janusz Perry. I am responsible for marketing at Treasure Hunt. And today I am here to talk a little bit about the marketing angle, and specifically talking about hyper casual games. Just for a brief introduction, I've been fortunate enough to be in the gaming industry for quite a while, having marketed a relatively broad range of uh, different games and products throughout the years. Currently at Treasure Hunt, we are focusing on casual games and essentially stepping to very mass market, easy to access, and in certain cases, hyper casual games. Some of the learnings that I will be sharing has also had some routes in some of the external projects I did through my uh, consulting company, Mercury Black, as well as to a very powerful network of uh, the best UA professionals I know in the industry from the UA Society. So really briefly, what we will be talking about. Uh, I would like to focus on three key pillars uh, for today. First, a little bit having a look at the definition of hyper-casual games, but more from a marketing approach. So what does the inherent nature of a hyper-casual game present as marketing challenges for us? Then enlist and kind of have a look specifically at those challenges in terms of the marketing hurdles. And finally, provide a potential uh, way to how to resolve those issues, how to conquer those marketing hurdles. Again, uh, some of this might be sounding da, Janos, you're Captain Obvious. Uh, having said that, I do believe that sometimes the simple ways are the most powerful to resolve things. So let's jump into it straight. So as we have heard, uh, hyper casuals are technically instant, very lightweight. Uh, so being instant and lightweight, that means that you know if the game takes a very long time to load, that doesn't provide the user experience that the users are expecting from such a, a simple and easy games. Second pillar, again, uh, very, very simple, snackable content, as uh, some of the industry people have been mentioning. You know, very easy to consume, very easy and accessible. And then from the simplicity comes the third pillar. Of course, it's really obvious, uh, a really simple to uh, enjoy experience, but it has to be addictive enough. It has to provide enough challenge to keep you going and keep you interested over a long time. So how does these three key characteristics translate down into marketing questions and marketing challenges? So the ultimate question is, how do we market a product that has basic limited content? So that means that some of the beautiful open 3D worlds that you would be experiencing in even mobile uh, platforms will not be readily available. Uh, it does tend to lack certain complex engagement mechanisms. As we have heard from Bob, of course, uh, the different kind of engagement points are emerging across the different platforms. Having said that, uh, the core loop is what essentially will be helping us to promote the game. And last but not least, again, since it has to be obvious and simple enough, uh, that means that it has to feel a little bit generic. Having said that, provide enough depth and context to avoid repetition and avoid making it bored after a short period of time. So how does this translate down to the free hurdles? Uh, I would essentially like to break it up by the free case stages when we talk about marketing management uh, of a gaming product. Of course, the first stage will be acquisition. Here, uh, discoverability, uh, as pointed out earlier, uh, I think is very important. Discoverability both in terms of paid and organic discoverability and organic reach. Uh, I think the two pillars work well in together because the more you invest into paid acquisition and funnel management, let it be app store optimization, let it be optimizing your creatives and your flows, the better you will be able to step ahead. And the second point, again, since these are very simple experiences, differentiation will be key. How can you differentiate effectively? Uh, there are multiple approaches and ways towards, of course, art style, uh, game design mechanics. In certain cases, we have seen certain IPs coming to different platforms to essentially provide a little bit of a specific uh, city to the product. Second pillar, of course, in terms of the challenges will be the engagement. For engagement, uh, first and foremost, the cost of switching, uh, again, already in a native mobile platform is relatively simple. You just need to uninstall the app if you don't like it. If you talk about even more hyper-casual, more instant experiences, you don't even have to uninstall the game. You just simply leave the experience and there you're gone. Second pillar here, again, will be the game mechanics. So how does the game itself promote engagement? How does the game help to essentially uh, progress through the game in an interesting fashion that will make sure that there is a long-term uh, uh, retention and engagement? Uh, 
having worked in a, a game uh, recently, actually, we have tested also the instant game platforms uh, at uh, Treasure Hunt. One of the key challenges uh, for us were essentially making sure that the game is simple enough, yet challenging. So the classical game mechanics that you know about, you know, daily challenges, engagement, retention metrics, they were the ones that essentially have been helping us to promote uh, these issues. Last but not least, uh, for the final pillar, of course, monetization. At the end of the day, we all are looking to make a sustainable business out of these activities. It's not something, well, outside of a, a very few people who do it for the sake of art, but this is something that has to be scalable and has to provide a reasonable bottom line. Not giving away too much of a clue, uh, critical mass will be important. So if you are not able to grow the game fast and steadily enough, you simply will not have the user base to essentially generate the revenues that you uh, look for. And last but not least, something that usually people tend to forget that quite a number of these games are heavily relying on ads. But at the end of the day, the ad revenues and the important revenue pieces will only be coming in if you're able to show relevant ads. If the people are not engaging with the ad content, with those different brand contents, the revenues that you can uh, generate, de facto the CPMs that you are looking to earn from these activities will be extremely low. And again, despite you might have a critical mass, you might still not have a business case. So to sum it up, uh, essentially this whole story is a volume game. So you need to make sure to have a really solid, good funnel. You need to make sure to drive the right type of users in. Make sure to essentially keep them engaged and retained enough. And last but not least, find the relevant ads to the relevant segments and show them in the right time. So how could we potentially conquer uh, some of these difficulties and some of these challenges to really quickly put up a, a reminder essential of the three key boxes uh, that we were looking at? So for acquisition, um, I'm going to probably again be kept in obvious and state the obvious fact. Uh, paid user acquisition and understanding your volume dynamics. Uh, I have been hearing pretty much since mid-2015 that paid user acquisition is going out. You know, the CPIs are too high, too difficult. It's really uh, difficult to kind of get through and make uh, a decent living. Having said that, like it or not, a paid user acquisition and very controlled media buys are still the very foundation of a perfectly measurable uh, and actionable uh, type of growth. This is something where you can build sustained portfolios that will be helping you to essentially drive a business and grow it. Volume dynamics, again, you know, the pay to organic, little bit tying into the organic discoverability. But again, if we talk about paid user acquisition as a little bit broader scale, thinking about the campaign funnel management pillars, for instance, you know, you will be working on app store optimization. And app store optimization as such will not only be helping you in terms of your paid user acquisition, but also will be helping you in terms of the organic reach and the organic discoverability. When we get to the second pillar, uh, to the engagement, of course, game design first and foremost. I mean, if we do not have a product that is compelling and engaging enough as a, a proposition, it will be very difficult to provide any kind of communication re-engagement point-based uh, activity to make sure to keep the players in and engaged. And as uh, Bob pointed out very well, one of the uh, benefits of the platform, of the Messenger platform, is the social context, the social engagement. Having said that, uh, this is not just a characteristic that should be present, for instance, in the Messenger platform. This is something that you have to systematically build into the game. Let it be friend invites, challenges, um, in certain cases, you know, uh, alliance and kind of more multiplayer dynamics you need to make sure that the people are essentially also helping you to recruit new users and um, helping and contributing to your uh, engagement. Last but not least for monetization, um, two key pillars. Um, back in the days when I was fortunate enough to work at uh, Flare Games, we essentially combined the UA team and the ad-based monetization team. Working in tandem with essentially two sides of the equation does help you to drive and optimize your flows pretty much end-to-end. And I believe, again, I'm not saying too much of a surprise, you need to have a very robust segmentation engine. You really need to make sure that you are showing the relevant right ads to the players that will be the most likely to respond. Ultimately, that is the item that is going to be helping you to grow your revenue base. Again, if you are just emptily showing and quasi spamming your user base with ads that are not relevant, that are not interesting, uh, they will probably be watching it. They will wait because you probably force them to wait. Having said that, they will not be meaningfully contributing and reacting to those ads. Henceforth, you will not be able to generate revenues from there. So these would be essentially the three key pillars. Again, a little bit zooming in to the specifics and the specificity of the hyper-casual segment. 
Uh, as a final piece, uh, a couple of uh, takeaways and kind of learnings that uh, I have made through working through these very light uh, experiences and light games. First and foremost, also has uh, been pointed out a number of times before, you need to build a network. Uh, in my experience, working with a single product, uh, it is extremely costly to build up, and if you do not have the capacity to essentially move the audience base that you already built up and cross-promote it to the next game and the game after, it will make it very difficult to make that single standalone product uh, profitable. There have been a couple of examples when that has been reached, but again, if we talk about the industry leaders, um, let it be Ketchup, let it be Voodoo, you can see that they essentially have a very broad catalog of games where they are able to effectively move the audiences uh, across. For the second pillar, again, this is a volume game. This is something where you need to understand and master analytics. So you need to be really ahead of the curve and on top of the curve, making sure that you understand how your users behave, how they are dynamically working in terms of engagement, and how does that will translate down to your monetization. And as for the final piece, um, as with everything in mobile marketing, you need to make sure to experiment rigorously. Um, I have been uh, in a couple of cases where uh, there have been uh, very knowledgeable game designers who said, well, this is how it's worked, this is, has worked in a number of cases. Um, having said that, my recommendation is always test and validate your hypothesis. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that you can do is, you know, this is how the market behaves. Uh, we know that we are working in one of the most volatile and most dynamic markets out there. So assuming that something has been working, let's say, six months before or 12 months before, that might necessarily be the case, especially when we talk about uh, such a, uh, an easy and light experiences. And if we are successfully mastering all these three pillars, and that's the point where I believe we will be able to get to a stage to have essentially a rocket ship product that will be kind of taking off and providing a sustained base and a sustained revenue. Uh, on this note, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take a couple of questions, should there be. Okay, any, so I was either that obvious or that boring. <laughs> uh, any oh, actually, yes, Janus, one thing I just wanted to, to confirm. I think I heard you say at the start, um, will a version of your presentation be available for delegates who want to? Yes, okay. correct. Uh, so uh, I think my slides are not yet up, but uh, if you send an email to Janos at treasurehunt.com, uh, I will be able to kind of send it across. Uh, otherwise, of course, uh, feel free to kind of just uh, find me and I will be happy to kind of send it there will be definitely a distributable version. Any other questions for uh, uh, for Janos? Maybe one question from me. Uh, how much of this was totally obvious and just kind of total boredom? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Well, I hope that there has been some kind of uh, specific focus areas on the casual gaming market that hopefully have been helping. Um, Janos, um, the, um, so hyper casual, obviously this is what the track is about yes. and, um, and game changes and, uh, and instant messaging. Um, Hyper casual is, a, I think, a, a, you know, a, a phenomenon at the moment. Do you, what's your kind of um, take on it, its rise to prominence and, and where it's going? Is it is it is is hyper casual, uh, you know, the 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 the, the next the, the, a sustained next big thing next big thing in gaming, basically. Uh, well, as far as I can say, you know, it's always very difficult to predict the future again, especially in such a volatile uh, gaming industry. Uh, having said that, uh, what I always like to say from a good old, again, textbooks type of marketing topic, you know, uh, the audience is where they are sitting. So if we see that, for instance, a very large audience, 800 million people is on the Facebook Messenger platform, you know, going after those important and valuable segments is essentially de facto the value that you're looking for. Like pointed out before, this is a volume game. So in order to successfully tap into those volumes, to those relevant segments, you need to make sure to be there prominent and present. So I do believe that there is an inherent need and there is a growth opportunity. Uh, how fast or how slow it will be, we will see. I think this is still a very new and emerging platform, especially if we talk about kind of the, the messaging ones. But again, if we take essentially the example from the Eastern competitors, you know, the Lime, the Cacao Talk, you know, these kind of experiences have been there quite substantially for a while and they have been essentially providing massive benefits and profitability. Great, thank you. Yeah? yeah? Sure. Sorry. Uh, about the simple graphics, like I've been wondering, is it just for marketing and what is the reason for the super simple graphics for hypercastle games? 
So um, number one, I think it pretty much ties into the lightweight aspect. So again, in order to provide an instant experience, unfortunately you cannot have this really big breadth in terms of the art and the visual style. The second piece uh, I think is that you know simple shapes, simple formats uh, also promote easy understanding. So again, if it's a familiar experience that you don't need to have like a 20 step tutorial to understand the game, but you go there, you maybe have you know one or two quick shots and then you understand how it works. If it is a more complex experience and from a visual world, a more kind of complex environment, I do believe that essentially just extends that period. And again, the problem with especially on, for instance, the Messenger platform, you don't even need to install. So technically, the, will the users be willing to have and spend the attention to kind of get to know the game and immerse into it? Or will they just say, oh, it's a little bit too difficult, or oh, it's not exactly what I'm looking for, and just switch to the next one? Hey, so um, you mentioned about uh, segmentation and user acquisition and so on. And you also mentioned that it's a volume game. Um, and you probably do this yourself a lot as a yeah. CMO. The question is, when everybody's trying to buy the same users and you need to buy millions and millions of them, at some point you'll just run out of actual users in the US, right? Um, and l right now everybody's going hyper casual. So how would you suggest that people go about this in terms of trying to get traffic without overspending on that traffic or tapping into new traffic sources that are maybe not as busy yet? Uh, very good question. I mean, that's ultimately essentially the $100 million question in the room. Uh, so uh, one of the things where I have seen success is usually when we work with um, user acquisition, we tend to very heavily focus on the gaming segments because, again, we do know that you know gamers of certain games and genres, they are expected to perform well for our games. Uh, I believe that's something that needs to be a little bit extended. So kind of what could be the, what I like to call the adjacent thematic or interest groups that could be essentially activated. So who could be potential players who could be interested but might not consider themselves as core players. After all, the overall idea of having this uh, is essentially to make it as inclusive as possible, to make sure that it is as available as possible. Not sure whether that completely answers uh, the question. So, so. Okay. I think one. Could you, some, uh, uh, could you share some benchmarks about the um, uh, about the numbers we should expect in marketing for hyper casual? Like, what's 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 um, a benchmark CR we should have, or uh, the CPS that we should expect? Uh, it is very difficult to say specifically because uh, despite I have seen a number of different games, um, I think pretty much every single one of them have been performing differently. Uh, my general expectation would be uh, to have really high uh, conversion rates if the CR rate would be essentially expected as the in-app um, in store conversion. Uh, definitely a minimum benchmark for me about 50%. So if you're not able to convert 50% to click into new users at least, ideally higher up. Uh, normally games that I have seen successfully performing at that specific conversion point were somewhere between 60 to 70. Uh, that assumes, again, correctly targeted traffic. And in terms of the retention and engagement metrics, uh, usually these games are relatively strong in terms of early engagement and early retention. Normally the difficulty and the problem comes when we talk about a little bit mid to longer term. So, you know, unfortunately quite a number of these experience is, you know, when nobody's seen day 30. So that's ultimately kind of a challenge. How do you build a longer term sustainable business along that?